the voice of Sherry. ASEAN Breakfast Call. First and foremost news from Southeast Asia. Morning. Good morning. Hi, this is Arlene. And this is Grace. And we are again going to give you a lot of news around Southeast Asia and also international news. Yes, welcome to Drian ASEAN. And then today we're going to start the news with... Of course, uh, the issue regarding on the court appeal of Anwar. Uh, as we all know, yesterday was the day where Anwar was uh, went to court to hear the so- Sodomy conviction appeal. And he's actually very con- uh, confident, confident about this. Yes. And also Mr. Anwar had questions on impartial, uh, partiality of the justice system after he was sentenced to five years in prison for allegedly sodomizing his former aide. Mm-hmm. This uh, issue has been going on for a few years, and then I would say a few decades. <laughs> a few decades, all right. <laughs> and then um, it's uh, continuously uh, raising issues from Mr. Anwa, and, and? You know, with the formal uh, federal court judge uh, Gospel Sri Ram leading his team of thirteen lawyers. Mr. Anwa was in the picture. Thirteen lawyers. Yes, that is a <laughs> quite team a lot of. of a, yeah, that, that is a football team. I would say. <laughs> Football team is a bit less, but there's a group of uh, quite a lot of lawyers uh, involving in this. And then, like you, uh, like Alin, you said that uh, he said he's very confident based on the fact and the law. And I mean, he's not saying he's confident just because he feels confident. It's because his team of lawyers really have quite a good case uh, to support whatever. Uh, I mean, to dismiss whatever so-called adiv- evidence that the prosecutors are bringing in or are charging against him. So uh, the uh, in court, uh, Mr. Anwar's lawyer actually went in all-out attack the credibility of his former aide. As we all know, Saiful Bukhari Azlan was his former aide, and he was uh, he, he he the reason why he's uh, in court because he said that Anwar sodomizes him in the past, and he and Anwar's lead counsel wanted the court to examine a photo of one Saiful sorry a photo of Saiful Bukhari allegedly looking normal a day after he was said to be forcefully sodomized. And then, yeah, um, <coughs> Saiful is very credible and acquitted in the high court wars on a different reason that uh, for the technical reason, nothing to do with um, Saiful's credibility. Court of Appeals similarly found that Saiful is very cre- uh, credible in this case. That's what the, um, the lead prosecutor, Saifi Abdullah, uh, said to Saiful. Mm-hmm. And also, outside the, the the federal court, the police actually saved, uh, 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 police actually set up barricades to stop Mr. Anwar's supporters from entering the compound. And the security was pretty tight, and the only selected media were allowed into the the, the courtroom. Actually, the scene outside the court was really havoc. A lot of supporters of Anwar, or those who believe that Anwar should get a fair trial, were there. And they all were anxious to see what was the verdict on uh, his case would be. So the the court battles continue anyway. Uh, it shows that uh, this is something that both camps, the opposition and the government, are taking this very seriously. Because uh, if you look at the photos, there are photos of people that are supportive of Anwar, uh, which stated that stop political prosecution of Anwar, but there are also posters or banners that are against Anwar. They feel that uh, Saiful is not being given the right kind of justice, mm-hmm. and he they say that we demand justice for Saiful because he is a victim. So it, it shows that this particular issue on Anwar has somehow divided, making the Partisan politics in this country more obvious. Of course, it is all, uh, it is it is obviously divided, and also um, Lim Kit Siang, who is the chairman of the Democratic Action Party, he mentioned that there will be a cure to the political fatigue and the cause of the re-energization uh, for political change in the country. So he, even though he says something positive, the serious matter in this country regarding Anwar's case is 
continuous um, issues. So this is sim- this seems to be a question of belief because yeah, some people say that some believe in Anwar, we believe in Saifu. You can choose anyone. But the real issue here is not about whether Anwar is right or Saifu might be right as well. It's about uh, to ensure that the court system in this country is fair. It's given a fair trial to both uh, the accuser and the being the ones being accused. How is it like I know these issues uh, among the international? Is it uh, we uh, are is this uh, issues getting spotlight among the international? A lot of the international community, especially international uh, uh, analysts, they believe that the problem lies within the court. If the court system is clean, is uh, F- efficient and it it is um, credible, which means that it has to analyze all different factors, all different um, facts and sources to show that either Anwar is guilty or not. It, it should not be an emotional trial. It should be a trial that is based on facts and purely but facts. this case has been going on, like you said, for decades. <laughs> and then um, with the law and the court system in Malaysia, uh, it clearly shows that um, uh, it has not been so clean and also transparent to certain issues. Mm-hmm. Besides Anwar's team, uh, the the one the prosecutor's team, uh, led by Shafi Abdullah, he was unfazed. He defended Saiful. In fact, he said that Saiful is a very credible person. The acquittal in the high court was on a different reason, technical reason. Nothing to do with Saiful's credibility. Court of Appeal similarly found Saiful very credible. But just to to, men, to give a mention of whether you, the person is credible or the person is not credible is not enough. It has to be solely based on evidence facts. and facts. So from Anwar, we jump into another country. Uh, this time is outside of Southeast Asia. We focus on India. India. So what's happening here is the Prime Minister, the new fifteenth uh, Prime Minister in India, uh, Narendra Modi, uh, he just uh, took the tea literally, but no questions uh, <laughs> regarding the the meeting with the press conference since the coming to power uh, five months ago underscoring the delicate relationship he has with the uh, fourth state. I like that the title is Modi Takes Tea. Yes. But no question. Shows that the Indians still love their teas. <laughs> well, um, it's also it also shows that um, he's being very calm in the situation, but he just do not want to answer. But he truly did pressing. want to strengthen the ties with the journalists and also media for reporting on a clean India campaign. He launched recently by taking the you know broom to <laughs> rubbish storm <laughs> in the, the New Delhi. And um, the Prime Minister cannot pick up on the broom alone. Of course, Modi uh, told invited journalists in the New Delhi. And he also said, you have turned your pen into a broom. And I think this is a huge (laughs) service. He was being very humorous in this matter. Hmm, interesting, Modi. Uh, he's a 64-year-old premier and has made extensive use of campaign speeches, glitzy policy launches and social media to propagate his message. In fact, you know, if you are talking about um, celebrity. I think he is one of the leading celebrity in the Twitter world because he has 7.3 million followers. <laughs> That's a lot of followers that he has. And we don't even get even more than 100 followers. <laughs> and I don't even have a Twitter. <laughs> now I feel outdated. <laughs> now, um, not only he wanted to, um, Mr. Modi wanted to strengthen ties with the journalists and also media, but then the recent news from uh, regarding the India is he also wanted to stress on the important ties with the Vietnam as well. So uh, what happened was, uh, according to Modi, he said we are two developing nations between India and Vietnam, and we will have been steadfast in our support for each other and we have stood with each other in difficult moments. Mm. So as we in India, we admire the people of Vietnam and for the courage and resolve with, uh, with which they have overcome more formidable challenges to, our, uh, to their nations. Mm-hmm. Modi is one of the examples where, I, I mean, we always criticize um, young celebrities or those kind of people who just want the fame but unable to articulate you know, critical ideas and stuff. And he might be one of them because his government has been criticised by commentators for being unwilling to face challenging questions. They would rather sit down and have tea, surprisingly. <laughs> and in fact, five months after Modi 
took power, power. the Prime Minister's office still have no official spoke spokesperson, which is shocking because you need to constantly provide information about what your government is doing, what kind of stance your government is uh, focusing on, and he seems to be quite vague about this. And also that actually by uh, giving out the more uh, information and updates from the government, that shows how transparent they are to the public. Mm-hmm. And I w- if I want to br- give a label to him, unfortunately, I would probably say he is those kind of celebrity, celebrity that really loves the, the, the limelight. The public and, attention. Yeah. In fact, he would rather snap selfie photographs with journalists rather than giving them answers which is well that clearly shows I that he loves to, to him. <laughs> he enjoys the he enjoys the limelight like uh, Alan you said and also he uh, today we were seeing a different muddy that's what um one of the uh, executive editor said and he's trying to make a personal connect with the journalist here <laughs> so this is quite interesting news coming from India. <laughs> I wonder how he would be treated in Malaysia or in South Korea. If he ever uh, makes his visit to Malaysia, we would love to see his reaction towards the public as well. <laughs> how he Malaysians welcome him as the Prime Minister of India. And the, the, talking about India, you know, India has quite a sum of population of Muslim. Of course, within Southeast Asia, if you're talking about Muslim majority population, it would be Malaysia, Indonesia. And when you talk about Singapore, usually you would not have the idea that Singapore is actually a leading player in Muslim tourism. That's very interesting uh, uh, news that we have here. Um, 60 million yen and a six, mu- six months, that's what the... Uh TFK Corporation recently spent on the renovating uh, a kitchen in Tokyo's busy, uh, Tokyo's busy Narita Airport and also preparing for the, the certification. And then the, um, this Muslim now represented nearly a quarter of the world's 7 billion people. That's a lot of huge amount of people that we have here. There's, and, a, uh, there's a lot of people. And yeah. I mean, some parts of the world, for example, the Western world, they still have this sense of Islamophobia, but they don't realize that Muslim are dominating the market, and if they don't, they don't really open up their eyes on that. It means that, and at the end of at the end of the day, they are going to merely alienate, not just in terms of economy, but also politically, they will create this unhappy. Uh, friction between the Muslim world and the Western world. Exactly, and also the power of this religion is growing pretty fast for the past uh, years. But yet in many countries that Muslims are eager to visit may not have offerings that can meet their needs, such mm-hmm. as prayer rooms and uh, um, their uh, particular you know, halal food options. Halal food is not easy to find in certain countries because uh, it's not really a tradition for certain countries to... N- um, to, to, to serve kosher meat, you know, if you want to put uh, the same level of what's the meaning of halal. And certain countries, pork is their main source of um, protein. Especially Asia countries, uh, a lot of people do enjoy pork as mm-hmm. their uh, main dishes. I mean, I give example of the Philippines. It's very easy for you to find pork dishes everywhere uh, in fast food in local restaurants and all that so for people to actually get halal food is not easy and it's frustrating for certain muslim because they want to travel around the world they want to experience the different culture to, to make friends with different people to enjoy whatever touristic uh, destination that the country can cater but at the end of the day uh, dietary means a lot to them Exactly, and also um, not only Japan noticed um, the increasing number of uh, tourists uh, from Muslim, but also Singapore, like we just mentioned, Singapore has noticed this uh, um, this phenomenon that Muslims have been traveling a lot, and then um, this potential of the global Muslim tourist uh, tourism industry has not gone unnoticed in Singapore. So there, there, the Singaporeans companies can capitalize on their familiarity with the Muslim customs to tap these opportunities. So they definitely they see this one as a huge opportunities and bring more chances 
for Muslim people to travel around. One clear example is this one firm. It's called Press and Rating from Singapore. They, uh, it totally caters its focus to Muslim travel needs. Set up in 2008, and the founder, Faisal Bahardin, he started this company because he noticed a lack of such services while on business trips for, for his former job at a multinational firm. He decided to strike out on his own to educate the hospita hospitality industry about the huge opportunity in the Muslim travel market and to help Muslim travelers make educated choices. Uh, what Crescent Rating offers is research, consultancy, training services on Muslim travel. It also issues reports on global industry and has created a rating system for the halal friendliness of travel and hospitality services based on the availability of halal food and prayer information. So if you look at a bigger picture when you talk about uh, trying to accommodate Muslims uh, in travel tours, it would be probably two key area. One is the dietary, halal food. And second is a place for them to perform their prayers. And this is key. Although it's not something that is uh, a compulsory because uh, a lot of Muslims sometimes they just do their prayers on the street, in a, in a corner, in an empty, in an empty corner. Uh, they can virtually do it anywhere, anywhere or everywhere. But to create a multi multi-faith room or a, a place where people can have um, can, can perform their prayer is but it's much better it, it create this hospitality among that will uh, that will definitely meet their Muslims. needs yeah and there also uh, a few necessities that Muslims have to uh, carry out and also these are the the three uh, few uh, key outbound to Muslim travel markets in this space like the Gulf countries Southeast Asia and also Western Europe it's, it's funny because the title is Singapore, a leading player in Muslim tourism, but um, next to Singapore is Malaysia. Mm -hmm. And Malaysia has become quite a hub for um, Muslim and in particular, in particular Arab uh, tourists, uh, trying to attract more of those to uh, Muslim tourists from the Middle East. Because the reason we attract more uh, people from mi Middle East countries is because of the what we have here, the culture and the customs that we have been practicing because of the Muslim religion in Malaysia. Mm -hmm. So definitely Singapore uh, has been uh, looking into this matter to welcome more uh, Muslim people. And also tourists from these areas are keen to visit countries that may not be familiar with the Muslim traditions, such as Japan, and South Korea, but then by opening more opportunities for them to come and then to be able to meet their certain needs, it will be actually a good uh, chance for them to open uh, uh, more opportunities for the country as well, not only from the Muslim Perhaps people. South Korea might follow suit. <laughs> <laughs> Um, another news, uh, a neighboring of your country, <laughs> South Korea, is China. <laughs> of course, China Communist Party is keeping grip on legal on the legal system. Uh, as we all know, China ruling Communist Party is a one party system. It is definitely reaffirm, uh, reaffirming its grip on the legal system. The party controls parliament, military, police, prosecution, uh, and the court systems. Uh, but and, ang and anger at a widespread injustice has emerged as an increasing uh, problem for it. Yeah, and also the principle of upholding the party's leadership must be adhered to when implementing the rule of law. The party said that 16,000 character statement carried by the official Xinhua uh, news agency it was listed above the equality before the law and upholding the rule of law in the document. So it seems like uh, the, that one point, having a one-party system definitely is easier to control uh, institution and society within China, multicultural China. China is very diverse in terms of the region, the ethnic groups, the society. But at the one hand, because of it is a one-party system that controls virtually every single institution in China, it create this unhappiness for certain injustices that happen within this institution. And, and also, uh, official media announced that the top retired general ensnared in the sea's anti-corruption. 
drive had admitted to taking extremely huge bribes in return for army promotions. And but um, there was no word on the fate of uh, Zhao Yongkang, the powerful former security chief whose investigation was announced in July. Uh, nevertheless, bribery or corruption is taken very seriously in China. We've seen a lot of uh, prosecu- de- uh, death penalty and persecution happening in China because of corrupt because uh, they were trying to persecute those corrupt officials and all that. But at the same time, they can't help but to see more and more officers are still getting corrupted, and this leaves people unhappy. For example, um, I, I mean, besides the bribery that you mentioned just now with Zhou Yong Khan, mm-hmm. uh, th- there are also issues, uh, for example, in police in China often extort confessions with violence, while local officials routinely decide the verdicts of court cases in advance, sometimes because of bribes or political pressure. Several rights lawyers have themselves been detained in recent months, and they are just lawyers, they are defending their a client, but is but at the end of the day, they are the ones being um, being put to jail because of the unfair legal system or the legal system that are being controlled solely by the party without having an open scrutiny on it. Definitely, it's evident to say and evident to see that uh, people are troubled by the unfair trials and the corrupt uh, judges. I mean. They may continue to encourage the rule of the law in China, but how much can the people actually really do when the party is ultimately in control? Mm-hmm. So that's a big question that uh, it's mm-hmm. been going on in China. But it's good that it's being reported because Xinhua cited that the Central Committee are taking this seriously. He, they said that officials who intervene in law enforcement will face criminal charges if they conduct causes, serious problems such as wrongful convictions. And the party will strengthen safeguards against extorting confession by torture and illegal collection of evidence. So they are taking this seriously, but are they implementing what they say? And it's also another execution issue is another problem. It's another issue altogether. Mm-hmm. So analysts say, are saying that such measure could definitely reduce the frequency of unjust verdict, but of course they are unlikely to apply in political politically sensitive cases such as the prosecution of dissidents of former officials. So at the end of the day, as said by Jane Duckett, a professor of political science in the University of Glasgow, he can't, she, uh, uh, she can't see the Communist Party giving up the prerogative to have the final say in politically sensitive cases. So it seems like it's still a chicken and egg thing. They want to reduce corruption, they want to reduce unfair uh, court system, but at the same time, they themselves are in control of everything. So it's hard to check and balance yourself. It is quite hard to check at the balance because they are not providing the exact details regarding this. I mean, uh, they said that uh, we can accelerate the national reg- uh, legislation on the fight against corruption and also set up an effective mechanism so that the government officials, they are not and also cannot and do not want to go corrupt. So moving back to Southeast Asia... Uh, a lot of people are talking about the ASEAN economic community. In fact, we will uh, somewhere in the future we will be inviting uh, the ASEAN business advisory a representative from the ASEAN Business Advisory Council to speak on this. Talking about AEC, its goals challenges for Indonesia is definitely very challenging because Indonesia is the biggest country in Southeast Asia and is definitely leading the torch in terms of creating this path for AEC. But whether ASEAN community can happen or not is definitely not an easy thing to say yes or no. However, the new Indonesian foreign minister is making it... uh, become is trying to make it to become a reality this actually was said by an interview at the jakarta post and he said that the new minister has to discuss the details of the preparation with other foreign ministers in the region so it's still very much a step-by-step thing even though aec is supposed to be launched next year 
And also, in addition to that, international acceptance is a, a, a pretty a big asset for Indonesia. And also, Indonesia did not have such an asset some time ago. Uh, other countries will hear, uh, hear them, and also they can partner easily with many other countries, ranging from northern countries, southern countries, developed countries, and developing countries as well. Seems like everything is lumped into one. But if you are talking about what kind of benefits having a single economic community would be compared to right now, it will be the benefit of of a free flow of labor and capital, which is good for companies and nations, reduce barriers to trade, and more opportunities to invest throughout Southeast Asia. The new union will be similar to the Euro- European Union in some ways, but without a shared currency. So we we will not have a minted ASEAN coin. But before that, the most important part here to step into the ASEAN economic community is to build a good healthy relationship with the countries throughout the Southeast Asia. As for this is very important uh, work for our um, Indonesia new prime minister. Mm-hmm. But the relationship shouldn't be just be at a government level. It should be at a societal level as well. Mm-hmm. When you talk about uh, society in Southeast Asia, a lot of Malaysians, for example, are still not aware of ASEAN, don't, don't even talk about AEC. It's something so foreign to them. They were like, they will probably know more about TPPA than AEC. It's something that is seldom being discussed about. So it's still a long way to go. For Indonesia, it's even a longer way because Indonesia is so vast. And it is definitely taking the lead considering it's the biggest economy in Southeast Asia. So preparing for the ASEAN economic community will be the biggest challenge for the Indonesia new foreign minister. So definitely um, the Indonesia ha- has to look into ASEAN matters and also ASEAN economic community. Mm-hmm. to bring up the awareness among the, uh, uh, from the public as well. You should say the new first female foreign minister because her name is Retno Lastari Priansari Marsudi. I hope I pronounced it rightly. <laughs> Always have trouble pronouncing names. So she will be leading the role in terms of trying to pave the way for Indonesia's foreign policy. So that's all for our news today. And then please do find us Adrian Asian, and we also have our tune in. Uh, we can you can download the tune in to your uh, mobile devices and listen to us. Uh, a lot of replays that we are will be playing uh, throughout the day. So um, catch on uh, our next session, which will be ve- quite interesting because we will be talking about Indonesia again. But this time, we will focus on West Papua. The kind of issues that they are discussing might be a bit uh, alienated from the rest of Indonesia's issues. Stay tuned.